I'm I'm very inspired by the fact that you are also a producer on the film in addition to, to writing the script. And so I wondered, although we know you did a great deal of research and Catherine Riggle is obviously very supportive of you, your team, if you could talk about what you did maybe earlier in your career, um, producer-wise, to kind of make yourself an asset and kind of create this space where they're interested in the film and they kind of can't do it without you or can't do certain things without you? Well, I um, started producing really by necessity because, um, um, I mean, Catherine was encouraging me to do it and she explained to me that the, mo the, the movie that I had written on Hurt Locker probably wouldn't happen unless somebody stepped into the role of trying to push it up the hill every day. And um, so I was happy to do that because it was my work. And um, I had no idea what I was doing and made every single possible mistake that you could make. And um, and at the time, each of those mistakes seemed really cataclysmic. But you look back and you realize it's OK. Like as long as basically the your the project is gaining some momentum, you're adding a little bit to it, you know, not every day, but as time goes on, um, then I think you're you're basically producing a movie. And um, that's how I kind of fell into it. And um, I, I actually enjoy it because it, it is a way of staying involved beyond the, the writing process. I mean, as it happens, I'm on set as a writer because of the thing that I have with Catherine. But, but it's, 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 it's really fulfilling to stay through the whole life cycle of the film as a producer, too, and, and, and be a part of this like really exciting creative team that makes a movie. But... Um, but there's no like trick to it. You just sort of do the stuff that needs doing, whatever that may be. Yes. That guy there. No. Okay, then you. Hi. Um, I ask this more as a general screenwriting question. It's has nothing to do with Maya's real life inspiration. But when I write, I find that sometimes I hold things back about a character's backstory because I do want to see what an actor or a director will contribute in that regard and I couldn't help but notice watching and reading Zero Dark Thirty that um, well let's just say my as a fictional character altogether like I felt like there was a lot left open to interpretation as to what was behind that tunnel vision focus maybe it was something in her past that maybe Jessica Chastain came up with but just in general screenwriting do you is, do you find like maybe there's a rule of thumb as to what maybe you give to the reader versus what you hold back? Just because starting out, I don't want to give off the impression that I don't know my characters. It's really just I have more of an open mind about it. Mm -hmm. um, well, you do know your characters, first of all. and I know that. And, and they're your characters. <laughs> that's another <laughs> thing that's important not to forget, um, you know, especially, you know, you created them. So I think it's any way that you want to create them is there is I don't think there's I don't really I'm not a big believer in rules of thumb especially when it comes to the creative arts I think that's kind of a bad idea but um, if it works dramatically it works I mean if it's interesting if it's gripping on the page if it if it if it is moving then then you've done a good job just however and if it's not then you know you should probably do something else do you know what I mean Yeah I guess maybe I feel like however whatever I leave in or leave out, as long as it sort of gets to the actual, like, you know, the message, the through line in the story, I feel like, I guess that's how I'm trying to go about it. But. I think that's right. I mean, as long as if you'll, you'll know if the scene works or you'll know if the story works. And it's, mm -hmm. there, there's, I mean, my first experience on screenwriting was working with Paul Haggis on a movie that became In the Valley of Ela. And, and um, Paul is, obviously a very experienced writer and so I was really desperate to learn from him and I had I had I'd had a career up to that point as a writer of, of, of nonfiction prose but I didn't know that much about drama and um, so I really studied every single thing that we did on in the Valley Vila and asked him a billion questions and it was a great learning experience to sit next to him as that as he was writing that and or through some of it anyway and when it was done and then I started Hurt Locker, I thought, okay, I like know how to write a screenplay because I watched Paul um, write in the Valley Vila. And then I realized, no, that was just Paul writing in the Valley Vila and nothing that he did on that screenplay was at all relevant to the Hurt Locker. It was a totally different story and everything that he invented for that story was invented for that story. It's like, um, 
you know, a, a one-off. So you kind of start at the bottom every time. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't like get too hung up on uh, methodology. It seems yeah. like you've had these really close relationships with the directors, though. If you were writing a script without a, a collaboration with the director, do you think you might um, write more stage direction or might write more about the characters because you don't have, because you're trying to convey how you see it to somebody you don't know? No, because I write actually a lot of stage direction. I mean, um, my action sequences are like insanely detailed, so I don't think I would do anything differently. I'm writing it not just for them. I'm writing it for me. I'm writing it for the actor. I'm writing it for the the DP, for the production designer. You know, for the guy that's got to pick what number bus. You know, is it number 30 or number 10? <laughs> I'm gonna get asked that question. If I don't know, he might make it up and make a mistake, and then you know. So I'm I'm thinking of all these things as I'm as I'm writing. It's kind of intense actually, um, but. Um, but um, uh, I don't know. I don't think I would change. It's just like how I do it. Uh, yes. I even know your name, April. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you because um, I feel like uh, you're the one writer who's kept his eye like on the war the whole time, and you know. Uh, I'm sure 9-11 had everything and a lot to do with it, but I just wanted to thank you for that. I'm a veteran, and it made a huge difference to me to see the articles in Playboy for the articles and to, <laughs> like, to know that there was someone out there like, okay, something's not right here, or let's ask right. more questions. And so I just really appreciate that. that. Appreciate and that. Um, in terms of this film and... I'm not, I, I'm not thinking about the Hurt Locker as much right now, but uh, how do you take these real-world situations that you've noticed, um, and in the case of your reporting, like, like journalism, how do you take them and then not become didactic? Like, I know, you know, you can sort of separate your belief systems and want to do the reportage, and, but how do you have, like, a little barometer in your head, a little person that's like, oh, well, that's too preachy, you know? Like, how, do you comb through it? I mean, or does it just come out? Perfect every time. <laughs> well, you know, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, um, you know, I'm, I. It's it's natural for me to to not. I mean, I'm kind of allergic to to that to 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 material that is overtly um, directive. That doesn't mean I don't think the work is directive. I think it is really directive, and I'm. You know, secretly thrilled when someone says something that was actually what I was trying to accomplish. Like when when Robin was talking about identifying with both the um, in, uh, torturer or interrogator and the victim. Like that's super cool to me because that's what I was trying to do. But I don't. But I. But it's uh, it's just like my taste to like um, try to be. Um, you know, try not to like hit every nail directly on the head. Try to come at it a little bit from the side. It's just like what I like. But um, um, I do pull back stuff if I feel like it's too too spot on, like at the first at the first blush. And then I might go back and be like, what is really happening here? Because it can't be that simple. And try to like find, uh, try to dig as deep as I can. I think everybody does that, but it it doesn't. No, I was kidding. It doesn't come out like that way the first time. You kind of look at it and look at it and go like, well, what's, what am I missing here? And try to be as, um, um, this is going to sound highfalutin, but try to be as sort of um, um, accurate to like the texture of whatever the experience is as you can, which which probably means it's if it's if you're being accurate, it probably means you're saying many things at once. So the scene for me, sh uh, if it's done right. I feel good if it works on many different levels. So yeah, of course there's a policy implication to the scene, but for God's sakes, there's also like this um, human dynamic. There's a dramatic implication. There's a implication for the character in that moment. There's an implication for the character in six scenes. And you, like the more layered something is, hopefully the more powerful it is. Mr. Clay Froman. Hi. Thank you. Um, can you speak a little bit to the were there scenes that were left out? Were there scenes or sequences? I mean, here it is, a 10-year journey. Uh, uh, you're trying to capture uh, a, a vivid vividness, if you will. There were, I mean, there was stuff we sh that was in, uh, that we shot that we didn't put in the movie. 
Mm. Because uh, yeah, for, for, for time, you, for, that's like. What do you mean? No way. That doesn't even feel like you shot it. I'm going to call the prop guy who screwed that up and find out. <laughs> what what difference does it make? Seriously. Well, was there was there was there stuff that was written? Yeah. Uh, I that I mean I I think I read somewhere that this was almost the first draft that was shot. It was yeah. So that's but there's stuff that we shot that was written that is not in the movie. Uh -huh. for sure. Scenes that, because they didn't work. Like you look at them in the editing room and you go like, they're not that good. Mm. Let's not use that. Or you go, or Catherine goes, you know what? Then I screwed up that day, or whatever. Or we don't need it in the story. The movie's too long. I mean, uh, a lot of it was cut for length. Um, some of it for just, you know, something I thought was great didn't turn out to be that great when we actually looked at it. For instance, I, I just want to ask, well, uh, because I did read the script and before and saw the movie before the quote unquote debate started. And if I remember correctly, I just wanted to throw this in there. At the end of every interrogation scene, it says they've learned nothing. And so that the point of the scene was, after all of the, what we just saw and went through, it didn't work. The information wasn't conveyed. We didn't learn the date of the next. There was event. actually a scene where they talked about that. They got cut. They talked about the... Um, the the that they were failing to get information out and they were bummed about it mm. but uh it got cut because it seemed really obvious at the time to us <laughs> in the middle of the movie <laughs> there was a moment like six months later when Catherine and i kind of looked at her she's like Fuck, it was more obvious to us than everybody else yeah no but it is the cumulative effect and and i think that by not giving too much Again, I think about the movies when I was a kid. I would, for whatever reason, I th keep thinking of Bridge Over the Wiv River Kwai. But oh, I'll things, take that. but the, but 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 things that force you to engage and think more, where you're not led and you're not told. And what you were talking about is there's all these layers of complexity. Everyone has their own agenda. You're, you know, you are identifying with every single person. It, it's it's the, it's the complexity, and it's something that that I personally miss in a lot of movies where I feel like I'm being um, talked down to. Mm -hmm. And um, and even in those scenes where I didn't understand the jargon, I felt that you were respecting me as the viewer to go, you know what, you can sit there, you can understand what's going on if you don't understand every little detail. You you know, I respect you enough that you'll you'll stick with it. And I, I thank you for that. Um, oh, yes, you, and then you. And I feel like I should know your name. You're always here. Uh, my name's Jim from the Scriptwriters Network, so you know my name now. Oh, hi, Jim. Uh, <laughs> what are the odds I'll remember that, though? <laughs> um, Mark, this is a question about action. In most of the action movies, there tend to be um, high-octane moments coupled with quieter, more reflective moments to give that ro emotional roller coaster ride for the audience. With your movie, it was just this constant onslaught of hyper-stimulation. Were you ever concerned that you may lose the audience at some point or did it not even enter your consciousness? You mean in an action sequence, lose them? I, well, I was worried about, we, Catherine and I were both worried about losing people in the first, whatever it is, until the until the raid, the first hour or something. And we were always like, God, if we can just get people to sit there until the raid, we'll be good. <laughs> but I, we were never, I was never worried about that once that big set piece started because, I mean, it, it the way she choreographed it and, and the way everyone did it, it felt pretty um, um, pretty engaging. I don't know. I, I guess feel the like audience I answer your so question. Too, so thanks. Um, I've got one question and a little short one following. I um, when I heard of, of this film in production after seeing Hurt Locker and thinking that was a courageous choice for a director, um, I thought Catherine is going from the frying pan into the fire as far as politics and, but not just that. You mentioned the three behemoths, uh, and not I'm not a paranoid, but I would think that there's some security issues that might weigh heavily on, on you as far as your, your own security. Um, but there's also the same three behemoths in the Middle East. 
Um, plus, the both the fundamentalist and the progressive Muslim community. Did you ever feel fear, or did you take um, any steps to make sure that you were safe? I mean, um, yeah. I mean, on a certain level, this stuff is is real, <laughs> and it's 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 um, it's it's for for a number of people, it's it's life and death. So um, we were all, I think, acutely aware of that. And um, doing a project like this does carry risks that are not there when you're doing a story about. Um, something that isn't doesn't touch on national security um, and we did I mean there were certain things we did do yeah to 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 try to minimize that risk but I, I sort of looked at it as this was like our contribution in a way I mean uh, there are people that actually take a lot greater risks that actually like um, you know put a backpack on and go live in Afghanistan for huge extended periods of time and there are people that um, like the Jennifer Ely character, you know, lose their lives doing this work um, all over the place. So um, on the scale of risks, it's it's higher for a writer <laughs> than, let's say, writing, you know. Um, One of my my guess this series great, was Twenty One uh, Jump Street. As great as that like, is, yeah, or Twenty One Jump Street. But 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 on the scale of risks that Americans take, you know, there there are certainly people that put themselves farther out on the on the limb. So. Um, but it's real. There's real security implications to doing this shit. Yeah, for sure. And the uh, follow-up question is simply, with Hollywood's conventional wisdom, um, are you prone to write a comedy next or <laughs> something else? I'm going to write, I have a, an idea for a romantic comedy <laughs> um, that takes place in Baghdad. <laughs> Are you serious or are you just... Involves a general and his affair. No, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I was interested watching the film about how much inaction and doubt and hesitation there is in the CIA and how Maya seemed immune to that. Um, when you were developing the character of the lead, did you always imagine him or her as a black sheep, an outlier, because that would be what was required to move the operation forward? To, could only an, a black sheep have found bin Laden, basically? Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, that's sort of, um, it's sort of historically true that the, that the courier lead, which was only really championed by a small number of people, was considered an outlier lead for a long time until like two, late 2010. So that that part of it was given to me by by life. And then you know, it's dramatized and 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 um, enhanced on certain levels in order to tell a story, but um, if it had been something else, I would have done something else. Like, do you know what I mean? I would I didn't I wouldn't have invented that goes back to that earlier question about responsibility and fictionalization and all that. I wouldn't have invented this like black sheep outlier version of the events if that hadn't been actually my understanding of how it happened. I'm sorry. We was there ever a point where you want, because I feel like there weren't any scenes where she had any doubt that she was right. She was so confident. And yeah. I thought that was really interesting. Did you ever, was there ever a scene in like an earlier draft? Where there might have been a few, yeah, a few of those moments. But, but by and large, she was a character that was I mean, I think I toyed with that, particularly on the dawn of the, on the eve of the raid, you know, where it's like, it's one thing to champion something intellectually and fight with your bosses and everything to have your word, or not your word, but your analysis be the basis of, uh, you know, s of, of sending two dozen people into a foreign country, like, illegally. It's That's pretty heavy. So I, there was a moment there where we uh, toyed with that. It, it is, though, you know, and I, I think that this is... <laughs> been observed probably many times, but that she's as fanatical as the fanatics on the other side because there's a there's well, a, a lack. I wouldn't I wouldn't draw an equivalency there, but she's definitely driven. I mean, there's fanatical, and then there's like fanatical. Do you know what I mean? But <laughs> but in that in that single-minded, yes, I, yes, totally. But in that single-minded belief that 
your way is right, period. And, and, and what this woman was saying is that there isn't a lot of doubt that you know you're doing the right thing and it's, it's full steam ahead. So well, I, you know, I'm there not are saying people, she was like... There are people like that. There were people like that on all sides of this detective story. It's just that she, the, this smaller group happened to be right. But there were other people who were equally adamant about their theory that bin Laden would ultimately be captured by following his wife from Iran. And they're, you know, like those people were really into that idea and they really believed it and they advocated for it and they pushed it and they made resources, you know, get devoted to that. So I just didn't tell their story because they were wrong. Um, yes. I'm giving you a work ethic. Did I, did I spot um, a picture of Jessica on Maya's computer screen? Yes. And was that little detail your idea? No. Ah, whose idea was it? That was Catherine's idea. <laughs> Very good. And when are you going to direct? I don't know. Somebody's got to be crazy enough to give me the <laughs> money to do that. <laughs> uh, yes. I read No Easy Day when it came out. Um, did you know about that project, and were you concerned it would steal thunder from your movie? Um, and also, th there was a detail about um, Bin Laden having dyed his beard with Grecian formula <laughs> the day before, um, but that wasn't in the movie, and I didn't know if that had come up in your research, and you guys just decided not to cover it. No, I didn't hear about that, and I wasn't. I didn't really do much homework on Bin Laden per se. It, bin Laden was always going to be like a specter in the film. It was not really, in a way it's about him, but in a way it's really not about him. It's about all the people that are trying to get to him. Um, and yeah, I was, I mean, I was, um, I was aware of No Easy Day and, and we were, I was curious to see what he would say um, and pleased that we were largely consistent with his account. And, you know, I'm sure there will be many accounts as time goes by and we'll be consistent with some of them and not with others and there will be points of divergence and that's just sort of what happens with history or any retelling of an event. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, thanks. A great job um, on the writing. I want to know the SEAL raid um, one of the things that really struck me about it is how we were totally rooted in the SEAL's perspective. And in a lot of action movies, a lot of suspense scenes, there's you see the guy with the axe behind the door waiting. And in this case, you know, just total silence, which I thought was fascinating. I was just wondering if you could talk about it. Yeah, that's a thing that, um, you know, we, Catherine and I talked about that she's very um, uh clear on and I think it's it's like an amazing idea it's a, you know we you basically put the viewer in the shoes of the of the in this case of the seals and and that that creates a certain narrative logic that you once you're you're saying that's the only point of view that's permissible um, now it's not and I that, that we did cheat a few times there's like a few cuts where you're looking at the seals as if you were bin Laden right so there, there are cheats, but but they're but they're quick, and um, and mostly for like 95% of it, you're with, you're with, and I think that creates a, a kind of um, like a Hitchcockian like tension because you don't you, you only have the same information that the character has, and and it's it's more nerve wracking than in some ways than cutting and knowing what's gonna. I mean, it's a different kind of nerve wracking if you know what's gonna happen. And we talked about that a lot, the difference between knowing what's going to happen and your character doesn't know. So in that case, the audience is one step ahead of the character, which is kind of can be really stressful because you want to shout at the screen like, there's a guy with an axe behind the door. Don't go there. And then another kind of tension of not knowing what's behind the door at all because you're just with the character. And it's like, you know, it's a philosophical thing, which you want to do. But but for this type of storytelling, we tend to stick with the um, like sort of that first person shooter perspective. That was also, to me, one of the most visceral parts of the movie, where it really made me feel what it felt like to be there, is that that uh, disorienting, uh, horrible feeling of not knowing what's there, not being able to see, um, it all again, all the darkness, and then you'd see those guys with those, like, uh, night vision goggles with like a was, wasn't that what it was with all the different things and it was so visceral and so even though you knew what was going to happen I was like you know I mean and that's obviously you know somebody asked was it you know everybody knew the end of the story but of course 
you know, then we could watch no historical anything. Um, but it's, 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 it's feeling, you know, that's really ultimately what movies are about. They're about thinking, but they're also about, about feeling and, and engaging with what's going on. Um, yes. So was the Maya character a composite or was she an actual single individual? And also um, with all of the main uh, sources that you interviewed, did you have to compensate any of them for their stories or uh, was it strictly your, uh, your experience as a reporter where you were able to draw all this level of detail and granularity out of them? She is she's based on a real person, but there are other people that did things in the movie that that, her, you know, hopefully her character represents their work, too. You know, there were uh, other women who did really heroic stuff and really great work that, you know, aren't really in the movie or in the movie very briefly. Um, some of them are kind of pissed off at me right now. <laughs> but um, why? Because they're not in the movie, but but um, or they're in briefly. But um but she's based on a real person. And um, I forget the second part of your question. Compensating your sources? Were, did you have to compensate your no, sources? No, I don't do that. That's There's like a rule in um, the U.S. It's different in the U.K., but in the U.S., we don't, we don't do that. Well, that's not true. I mean, people buy life rights all the time in the movie business, but I didn't. I don't um, um, approach this um, in, in a way of um, just researching a historical event and, and, the, and the, the people that participated in it by definition, what their activities are sort of, you know, is they're personal, but they belong to all of us. Um, two more questions. That gentleman, you, and then you're going to just wrap up the whole evening. No pressure or anything. No? You can do it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I like to mess um, with people. Um, I was really curious how you approached the um, depiction of bin Laden's body. Cause it seemed like a very difficult... <laughs> And daunting kind of decision, but you handled it so beautifully and artfully. And I was wondering what kind of conversations uh, kind of got you to that decision. Um, I don't remember. I know we talked about it a lot. I don't remember exactly what the if there was uh, a debate, but I think that we always felt that um, uh, less was more in that case, and. Um, there was something, I mean, you do sort of see slivers of him, but the, it felt actually more powerful not to really um, ever settle on him because it, it, in a way, it, I don't know. I, I don't really know if I can articulate it, but it's definitely something we thought about, and, and it just felt like the um, that the absence of, of uh, you know, would be more powerful and chilling than, than I mean, he finally, for, for most people, he's a specter from beginning to end, right? For all of us in this room, unless Peter Bergen's here, um, <laughs> it's a bad joke. Um, anyway, so I don't know. I don't remember what the actual conversations were, but I know we talked about it a lot, and 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 the feeling was that um, um, it should just be something that's smudged and and seen in uh, uh, almost in passing. You see it in her eyes a lot. And you and you yeah um, so because again finally it's not really it's a movie about her, about the, the Jessica Chastain character and, and all that and so if the moment is going to work it needs to land on her um, so there you linger for like a minute and that face man her face yes okay so this well I have two yeah, I'm sorry I was oh. really just <laughs> messing with you and I was gonna say I, I have to ask two questions and the first question is definitely not a wrap up question. <laughs> I'm really question. seriously <laughs> just messing with you. First question, um, I was fascinated by your use of the supers, and I was wondering at what, you know, the titles, were, were they in the script? Like, at what point there were a did couple that, that were. In? There were a couple that were, and then more came in in post. When I was watching the movie one day, uh, one of the early cuts, I was just like, nobody is going to ever follow this movie at all, ever. <laughs> <laughs> And so we were just like, well, maybe we can make it a little easier by putting some um, chapter headings. And it's sort of a the story told in chapters anyway, so it felt organic. And um, and then so we batted around some ideas. And um, they're the only the one that was really hard. They they were all basically. I think I came up with all of them right away, except for one that was. Um, 
and I don't actually even remember what it finally was, the one that describes the Jennifer Ely um, episode. That was, um, yeah, the Camp Chapman thing. But but the but the yeah, but the chapter heading it. is um, <laughs> is not that. It. It's uh, the meeting. Okay, so right there were like ten ideas for that one. That's why I can't even remember it because it was <laughs> we tried the one that I liked the mole for a long time. But then we would think of the mole, the mole. People are gonna think there's like a little furry animal or something. Like <laughs> who knows? Does that's really a term anymore? That's like a '60s term, right? And then. <laughs> then we had double agent, which we thought was cool, and then we thought, but then you're going to know what's going to happen, and then he's not really a double agent, he's sort of a triple agent, so then we had triple <laughs> agent for a while, and then um, the meet, the meeting, that was finally like, okay, like, kind of neutral, but maybe not the best one, but um, but the others were, it just kind of came out, and then, and some of them were kind of ironic, like the canaries, and some of them yeah. were very descriptive, like the Saudi cell, and um there, I remember there was one conversation where somebody said, like, should we sort of make these all the same tonally, or does, is it okay that they're kind of all over the place and each one is sort of very literary, and the other is sort of very journalistic? And anyway, so it was like, hey, we gotta we gotta wrap this movie. So <laughs> just <laughs> this is what they are. <laughs> did yeah. you have speaking of did you have your uh, second part uh, of the question? Well, or? I don't know if this is a wrap up question or not, but I, I love the super. So <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess a wrap-up question would be something like, I actually, um, I worked with a lot of current affairs authors, and I know, like, when you do something like this, they're so timely. You know, there's a real press toward the end to just get it out, get it done. And then, of course, the minute the book publishes, you're like, shit, should have put that in, should have put that in. Do you have any feelings like that? Like, gosh, I wish I'd gotten this in, or I wish, you know, done this differently? Or Not really. I mean, I, I, we crammed a lot in. I don't really have any regrets on that score, and I think there's still a lot that's in the movie that people are, you know, that's there to be discovered in the pages of, let's say, foreign policy and talked about and looked at. Not that the movie is worthy of debate, but like actual descriptions of things that, you know, who knows, maybe people will talk about how accurate they are in a different way as time goes on. But um, no, I felt like we, we, we jammed it all in, and there wasn't that much. Um, I'm sure there will be more things that come to light as time goes on, but I felt like I had a pretty good handle on the story. That well, Actually, that was an excellent wrap-up question, and I'm glad you took me just messing with you so seriously. <laughs> I think that's really cool. Um, Mark, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank Love you. the Thank movie. You. And Thank you all for coming. And He's going to run out of here now. And you guys are the best audience, really. I, I'm so proud of the questions you guys ask. Great question. You're such a crack up. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great question.